Jerry Harrington here tonight. Uh, I'll be reading from his new book from Kansas University Press, Thunder from the Prairie, The Life of Harold E. Hughes. Um, and tonight we'll, he'll be doing a presentation on the book, um, and then we'll have time to take questions from anyone that has any. And then he'll be here to both sell and sign uh, copies. Um, and uh, this will also be live streamed, so when we do the q and A, I'll come around with the mic just so we can catch it for folks that are watching from uh, their cozy homes. All right, thank you so much. Please welcome Jerry. Yep, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks for coming out on a cold night like this. Um, if, in case you haven't seen copies of the book, this is what it looks like. <laughs> and. Uh, um, you can also, uh, uh, since we're in a library, also you know, make use of the Iowa City Public Library to get a copy, although you've got to wait in line, as I understand it. Um, Harold Hughes was governor of Iowa from 1963 uh, until 1968, a U.S. senator from 1969 to 1974. Uh, his life spanned from 1922 to 1996, and let me go through just a few elements of his life, real briefly. Um, Harold Hughes was born in Ida Grove, Iowa, a town in western Iowa. And the day he was born, uh, the farm on which he was living uh, burned down. And so that was his entry into life. Um, and uh, his, his parents managed to pick themselves up and uh, through the... Uh, a help of friends, neighbors, and relatives. Uh, he was a World War II veteran, uh, a truck driver. He spent one year in college and then uh, got into truck driving in western Iowa. He was elected Commerce Commissioner. This is back in Iowa history when the Commerce Commission was a three-member board that uh, was elected statewide, and they regulated the businesses or the, uh, what was the regulation of businesses, at least back then, in the 1950s. He was elected governor in 1962, and then he was re-elected twice. This is back when Iowa governor terms were two years. So he was elected for a total of six years. Um, he was elected to a single term to the United States Senate, and he retired after one year to go into lay religious work and counseling alcoholics. So those, that's kind of the bare bones summary of his life. But it really doesn't do justice to the man. Um, for one thing, his personality. He was a natural leader. Uh, the word charismatic is an apt description of him. He was a handsome man, as you can see, with a deep, resonant voice. Uh, there are those who say he had a voice borrowed from God. Uh, and he was one of the most charismatic leaders in Iowa history. He pulled himself up from severe alcoholism. And I, when I say severe, I mean really severe. A person who takes one drink and wakes up three days later not knowing where he's been. And, he pers and when he recovered, after he uh, reformed himself, he, w he counseled other alcoholics. And he created the first, for the first time, a federal program in order to aid alcoholics. As Iowa governor, he transformed the government of the state. And from a 19th century form of governing, bringing it up to date into the mid 20th century. And he was willing to face controversial issues where others did not. And we'll discuss some of those as we go on. He was a national leader in the late 60s, early 1970s against the Vietnam War. And he also dug into American military deception, exposing lies and, and deceit, bringing them to light. And I'd like to provide further details about this remarkable life. Uh, for one thing, I talked about his parents and the burning down of the farm. They came from the hills of Kentucky, and they knew what life was like to be poor. Uh, they married uh, in uh, 1912 and moved to Ida Grove, Iowa, but not without some difficulties along the way. Uh, they had some relatives that lived in western Iowa, and uh, 
they wrote to them that you come out here and you'll start slower out here, is what the description was. But on the way, they, their car broke down in Bloomington, Illinois, and they didn't have any money, so they stayed there for five years working in the county poor farm. Uh, his father and mother, uh, Lewis and Etta Hughes. And at the poor farm, his mother saw conditions of people living that were a lot worse off than they were. They finally moved to Ida Grove, Iowa, and uh, they relied upon, after the, and they uh, rented a farm that burned down in, uh, 19, in uh, uh, 1922. And they, again, they relied on relatives and neighbors, but they knew what, what it was like to be very poor. Harold Hughes was born in 1922, and as he grew up, his mother infused within him the concept of the Christian social gospel, that it, that it was the commandment of Christ in order to help others who were less fortunate than you. And that really impacted his life and, pro and propelled him during his political career. He had an older brother whose name was Jesse. Uh, a couple years older than he was, Jesse was born in Bloomington when they were working at the poor farm. And the two were inseparable. In fact, uh, they, they uh, had the name, uh, they were so big, they were called pachyderms. And they had the nickname, Jesse was Big Pack and Hughes was Little Pack. Jesse died in a traffic accident in the early 1940s, which was devastating to Hughes. And it was while in high school at Ida Grove that Harold Hughes began to drink. And it wasn't a severe problem at that time, but as life moved on, he, it was more and more of a problem. Um, and he was drafted into World War II in 1942. Uh, but before that, he ran into uh, or uh, met a woman, Ava uh, Mercer, and, and married her, had a child before he left for the service. And she was pregnant with their second daughter uh, when he left. And while overseas, he saw combat in the invasion of Sicily and Italy. And this was severe combat. He was part of the contingency, part of the group of soldiers that invaded Sicily and uh, being thrown onto the beach when rockets and, well, and guns and all were coming right at him. And it was, he saw the hell of war, as well as in Italy, where he also came down uh, with, a, with a, um, uh, a disease that, that uh, caused him to, to leave the service for a while, go into a British hospital where he lost about 50 pounds. Uh, after service, he came back to Ida Grove, went to the University of Iowa for one year, and then uh, dropped out and he became a truck driver. And uh, he um, worked for a firm that was based in Ida Grove, uh, an independent trucker driving back and forth between Ida Grove and Chicago. And it was also during this time that he continued his drinking. Uh, there were several times when he was in the service, he was uh, in jail for drinking, uh, or, or what consequently what actions he took while, while being drunk. And there was an incident in 1952 where uh, things got so bad that he went out for a night uh, and he told his wife he was coming back uh, early that evening, stayed out drinking with friends, and she took her two daughters away, went to her mother's house. He just came back home and was so despondent uh, about that that he um, attempt, um, attempted suicide. And he took a gun put bullets in it, and this is described in his memoir, The Man from Ida Grove, went into a bathtub and was going to put the a gun in his mouth, and at that point he had what he described as a religious conversion, uh, an epiphany, what have you. And from that point on, there was only one incident, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, where he had a drink and was drunk. But this was part of the effort on his part in order to reform himself. Um, as a trucker, he organized independent truckers together. Um, there were the two types of trucker, truckers, independents, and then there were those who um, were part of corporations. And these independent truckers were kind of fighting against one another and lowering their rates. 
what he started to, he started to organize both around the Ida Grove area in western Iowa and then throughout the state and set up an organization to aid these independent truckers against the large corporations. Um, for, for instance, for lower insurance rates. And in doing so, he uh, ran into the large trucking firms and also the State Commerce Commission. That he thought there were some instances where the Commerce Commission was giving advantages to the trucking firms, uh, the large trucking corporations. And also he thought that they were some of the commissioners or some of their employees were getting payments under the table. Well, he got so angry about this that he went and talked to the governor of Iowa, who was by the name of Herschel Lovelace, who was a Democrat, elected in 1956, re-elected in 1958, and started complaining about these, the Commerce Commission. Well, since it was independently elected, there was very little that Hughes could do about it. Um, but he sat down with the governor and, and complained about it. But what was important about this meeting held in 1957 was not so much his meeting with the governor as much as meeting the governor's aide, a man by the name of Park Reinard. And I've searched high and low for a picture of Park Reinard, couldn't find one. Um, but Park Reinard was everything that Harold Hughes was not. Uh, he had a, Park Reinard had a master's degree in English literature from the University of Iowa. He lived in Iowa City as a secretary to Grant Wood, the artist, while Grant Wood was a professor at the university. Um, very polished writer, polished speech writer. And what he saw in Harold Hughes that day was the potential of a great leader and the potential of a, of a man who, if molded and shaped and directed, could accomplish great things. Well, Loveless saw a lot of that too. And he persuaded Hughes in 1958 to run for one of the Commerce Commission posts. And that he did. Uh, and he was elected to one of the three posts. Now, Hughes had a lot of political um, aid, or a lot of political organizations that he really didn't know he had created. He was a lay minister for the Methodist Church. And he went around and gave sermons around the state for preachers who were taking vacations. Uh, he had a lot of contacts through AA, the Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and of course, he had a lot, a lot of contacts in the trucking organizations who knew how to place signs around the road for people could see them. Uh, so he was elected to one of the Commerce Commission posts. So I've been told he did a good job of kind of eliminating some of the corruption. And he looked around, and in 1960, he saw that um, there were not anyone running for governor that he thought was really good enough. So in 1960, he ran for governor. Uh, he lost as kind of a, uh, uh, an insurgent against the party establishment, but impressed an awful lot of people. And in 1962, he ran again against the, the uh, incumbent, Republican incumbent, Norman Irby, uh, um, who, had, who was the former attorney general of Iowa and had been elected in 1960. Now, it would have been, he was... Uh, uh, it's kind of in vain for a Democrat to run in a Republican state, but hey, there was an issue that came up, and it was the issue of liquor by the drink. Uh, Iowa at this time had a liquor monopoly, and the only way that you could buy liquor in Iowa was to go to state liquor stores. Uh, and there was serving liquor across the table or by in, in glasses uh, was illegal. Um, but this was practiced all over the state. You could only be, and the only place where you could serve alcohol was at beer taverns. Uh, the Des Moines Register in June of 1962 ran a series of articles showing that the liquor by the drink had been violated in 66 out of the 99 counties. And Hughes and his staff, his campaign staff, debated uh, where they should stand on this because people had been ignoring this law for years but now the register raised it up a level. And Hughes decided to come out in favor of liquor by the drink. Uh, and this proved to be quite a uh, selling program. And he won that uh, in 1962 over Norman Irby. He had been behind in the polls up to that point. And in the last week, he caught up and then defeated Irby. 
And this is one of my favorite Frank Miller cartoons where Hughes was elected amidst all the other Republican elected, Republicans elected in 1962. Um, and liquor by the drink was passed through the legislature in 1963, which is probably, a, as Hughes called it, a big nothing, uh, because it eventually would have happened anyway. But what this did, it gave him an issue in order to be elected governor. He was elected to two more terms, or, um, and re-elected. Um, and another, another issue that came up in 1963 was something called the Schaaf Plan. And this was a reapportionment plan in the state legislature. The state legislature in the House was allocated by geography. Each county had one legislator. And if you were a large county, the top nine largest counties had an extra legislator. But still, as you can see, this was overwhelmingly rural-oriented. And conservative forces, um, in effect, the Republican Party of the time, had an overwhelming majority in the House and uh, a pretty solid majority in the Senate as well. But the, uh, there was call for reform, and the Far Iowa Farm Bureau and the Iowa Manufacturers Association developed a plan called the Shaft Plan, the, uh, named after a legislator from um, the Quad Cities. And they uh, called for the House to be elected geographically. Each county had a single legislator, and the Senate by population. But still, you're creating the House as a conservative bulwark against reform. Hughes could have sat uh, back and simply let the plan go into effect because both houses of the legislature passed the plan, and it was up for a vote for the people in December of 1963. But he campaigned throughout the state in a very energetic way and defeated the Shaft Plan in late 1963. As I said, he uh, was reelected. Uh, 19, the election of 1964 was quite interesting. Uh, he ran against the um, Attorney General of Iowa, Evan Holtman, who was a guy that uh, probably wanted to be governor ever since he was a Boy Scout. And uh, it would have been, Hughes probably would have won the election anyway. This was the 1964 Johnson landslide, where Democrats won pretty much everywhere. Uh, but on the last weekend of the election, Holtman came up uh, with an issue in early 1964, Look Magazine approached Harold Hughes about doing an article about him as a recovered alcoholic. And he agreed to the interview. Uh, and he told the reporter that the last drink he had taken was in 1952. In reality, uh, in 1954, Hughes had gone to Florida uh, to persuade a friend of his to come back to Ida Grove, who was an alcoholic. And when he was there, the friend said, okay, I'll come back, and by the way, let's celebrate. Let's have a drink. It was a major mistake, but Hughes felt he had to accompany the guy or else he'd lose him. And uh, soon uh, Hughes found himself behind the wheel of a car uh, on a railroad track uh, with a police car behind him, and he was arrested for drunken driving. They put him in jail overnight. Uh, he uh, asked, uh, what do I do, pay a fine? He says, well, um, you can put money up for bail, but you're not going to have a trial or not going to have a judge here for another three, four days, and Hughes had to get back to Iowa. So he, he put money for bail, forfeited the bail, and drove back to Iowa. Evan Holtman found out about that. And on a Friday debate uh, in front of the Des Moines Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Friday before the election, the uh, Holtman exposed this and, and rose up and said, okay, you've got Harold Hughes here, who all along has said in, in, a, in an article that he gave up drinking in 52. And I have proof here that he had, had drunk later, was in fact was picked up for drunken driving. How can you trust this man? And the room was completely silent when Hughes, and, and Evan Holtman was about five foot four. Hughes was six foot three, 230 pounds, rose up, and he had a speech prepared, but he threw that away, and said, 
At this 11th hour of the political campaign, my opponent has come up with an item out of the past which he hopes will blacken my reputation and influence the outcome of the election. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I regret that the subject of my alcoholism has been brought up. But now that it has, I want to respond. The answer is yes. I was in Florida. I did get drunk there. I was drunk driving my car. I was thrown in jail where I spent the night. I posted bond and left the city because there was no judge available the next day in court. And he started to choke up as he continued. But I want to explain one thing. And I'll never talk about it again. And that is this. I regret that my family has to, be, has to continue to suffer because of my alcoholism. It is bad enough that I suffer, but it's worse that my wife and children have to suffer because of it. I'm deeply hurt that they have to be dragged through this again. I am an alcoholic and will be until the day I die. But with God's help, I'll never, never touch a drop of alcohol again. Now, can we talk about the real issues of this campaign? And with that, the, the room rose in applause. And Evan Holtman was never heard of again in politics. Um, Hughes won the, well, that election by an overwhelming landslide. In fact, he took more votes in Iowa for governor than LBJ did for president. And that was noticed in the White House. Um, so he was elected with an overwhelming Democratic House in Iowa, an overwhelming Democratic Senate, and they commenced to begin what was an historic legislative session in 1965 that transformed the government of Iowa. What were some of the accomplishments? The community college system of 15 community colleges were created. The death penalty was repealed and remains repealed to this day, and that was a, a significant and profound uh, action of Harold Hughes that would really went to the core of his beliefs. Um, they established studies on government reform, tax and school funding allocation, which had been a significant problem for decades. And they, they moved ahead to, with these studies that had impact on the 1967 legislature, two, legislation two years later. There were nine constitutional amendments, one including of the legislature meeting every year instead of every two years. There was openness, more openness in state government. Up till that time, committee meetings in the legislature could be closed. That was forbidden. The educational TV and radio network was created. The Iowa Civil Rights Act of 1965. Reapportionment was raised again after the Shaft Plan to make it more fair and more equitable. Um, quite a significant bit of, of, of creation in the legislative effort. But there were other things that Hughes did. For instance, there was the Amish issue. Uh, this was in Buchanan County, which is in north uh, uh, eastern Iowa, around the Old Wine uh, Fayette area. And there were a group of, uh, of Amish families that had two private schools. Uh, and for years, they had been operating illegally. That is, they hired teachers to teach their kids that were not state certified. And in fact, had very had no college education, just teaching the kids. And they didn't want sort of outside influences to impact their children. Uh, but this was against the law, and they were violating the law. Um, and uh, the, the issue began in the early 1960s, and by 1965, um, the Old Wine School District, which supervised those Amish schools, or they were within that district, thought they had reached an agreement. And they came out to the schools one day and uh, gathered the kids together. They thought they were going to take them to one of the schools in Old Wine, and the kids gathered around the bus. And then someone yelled, run! And the kids ran off into the cornfield. Of course, there was a Des Moines Register photographer there and, uh, who took this picture, which appeared on the, the uh, front page of the Saturday edition of the Des Moines Register. And in case you missed it on Saturday, they put it in the Sunday edition as well, which blanketed the state. This was a national news story. Well, at this point, 
he has decided that he had to step in and, and reach some sort of resolution. So he went to uh, and met with the Amish families, met with them for uh, three hours. Uh, and when I say families, I mean the, the elders of the, the Amish community, which were basically a bunch of, of uh, old men, and talked with them and really could empathize with them, and he understood them. Then he met with the Old Wine School Board, and I talked with one of Hughes's aides. When, when Hughes went into the, the meeting with the Old Wine School Board, there was tension in the air that you could cut with a knife. But Hughes said in his very direct manner, uh, okay, I understand you're only trying to execute the law, and what I'm here is to act as a cushion for you, and I'm, I'm going to work with you, and we'll see if we can work out. And what eventually they worked out by, the, by 1967 was that the Amish kids would have tests once every year to test that they were getting educated properly, because that really was the reason to do it. That took an awful lot of negotiation, took an awful lot of meetings, uh, but finally a resolution was, was met, but not without, or it would not have happened without the leadership of Harold Hughes. He was reelected in 1966, and the 1967 legislature had significant and profound impact on, on the Iowa government. There was a Democratic Senate and a Republican House. You know, the first uh, term that Hughes had, there were two Republican houses and Senate, uh, House and Senate. The second year, a Democratic House and Senate. This time, there was a Democratic Senate and Republican House, and it really showed the effectiveness of Hughes to work across party lines and to bring people together. They removed the three-member commission from the Iowa Tax Commission, which was run by a three-member board, as well as the Department of Social Welfare, a three-member board. These were abolished, and the Department of Revenue and the Department of Social Services were created, both with executive professional directors. They revamped the tax system to make it more equitable which lowered property taxes by increasing and, and also increasing income taxes. And so the state assumed much of the um, uh, funding for local schools to make funding for schools equitable across the state. Um, and it also dramatically reduced property taxes or allowed property taxes to be reduced because the state was picking up uh, the payments for, for schools, or much of the payment for schools. They also further reformed the reapportionment rules. Um, so significant and profound changes over at least two sessions of the legislature. We're talking about the mid-1960s here. And in the United States, it was a land of racial unrest and violence in some instances, particularly in Des Moines, in Iowa, and in Waterloo. Um, there were upheaval and, and, and other cities as well. Hughes saw this and knew that something had to be done. What he did in 1967 was to get business people together in, in Des Moines and some other cities and provide summer jobs for black youths uh, to kind of alleviate um, um, and, and provide them with things to do rather than simply walking the streets at night. Uh, and he also took part in what was called the crisis conferences. And Hughes, in late 1967, he knew he came from uh, Lily White, Western Iowa, and what he did was get himself out of his governor's chair and went into black communities in Des Moines, Sioux City, Waterloo, Council Bluffs, Cedar Rapids, and talked with, with black families, uh, sometimes meeting with them until 2 o'clock in the morning and trying to understand their situation sincerely. Uh, and he got together with clergy, uh, Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish, and he, uh, he, they put together for him um, eight sites around the state where he went to give speeches on what he learned and what he was thinking. And I have some of these quotes. I was, and, and these were direct speeches. He didn't dilly-dally around or or uh, it was certainly no uh, uh, starry-eyed liberal. I was appalled by my own ignorance, and I can only feel shame that I hadn't done this, visits and input before. If a man says he loves God and loves not his brother, then he's a liar. 
They, meaning black, and he primarily we're talking about black men from his perspective, can't pull themselves up by their own bootstraps if they haven't any boots. I think this is an example of, of leadership at its highest level, to speak directly to problems and trying to bring people, in, in this case, basically white Iowans, so uh, information to try to understand and try to alleviate racial injustice by, by creating empathy with the fellow African-American neighbors. Uh, he carried this on in 1968 with programs in 16 cities around Iowa, uh, getting business people together with local mun municipalities and others in order to give African-American African youths jobs during the summer. And then there was the Vietnam War. Hughes initially was a supporter of the war. In fact, in 1965, he was a group of governors that went to Vietnam for a tour, and he spent about a week there touring various sites in Vietnam. He was a great supporter of LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who initiated the uh, uh, sending combat troops to Vietnam. But as time moves on, and especially as a result of his visit there, he knew there were things that he was hearing from the administration that were not right, that were not correct. And he also was contacted in late 1967 by Robert Kennedy, who was contemplating running against Lyndon Johnson for the presidency, but knew it would be an insurmountably difficult job. But Kennedy knew uh, that Hughes was considering leaving politics. He called him up one day and said, uh, Senator uh, uh, or uh, Governor, I think you ought to run for the Senate. And Hughes needed a lot of convincing. But as you can tell by this photo, Robert Kennedy was an intense conversationalist and convinced Hughes to run for the Senate. Um, Hughes also supported Gene McCarthy uh, as it got closer to the Democratic Convention. McCarthy was a senator from Minnesota who opposed Lyndon Johnson and nearly defeated him in the New Hampshire primary in 1968. Hughes would have supported Bobby Kennedy for president after Kennedy won the California primary in June of 1968. But as we recall, Kennedy was assassinated that night. Prior to the Democratic Convention, Harold Hughes came out uh, and supported McCarthy and gave his nomination speech at the Democratic Convention. Not particularly popular among a lot of Iowans, and particularly for a man running for the Senate and trying to get support. But he felt that uh, McCarthy had very little chance of getting the nomination, but if someone like Hughes didn't support him, he had virtually no chance. McCarthy went down to defeat. Hubert Humphrey, vice president, got the nomination, and Hughes came back to Iowa to run for the Senate with Humphrey at the head of the ticket. He ran against Dave Stanley in 1968 for the Senate. Dave Stanley was um, from Muscatine, Iowa, a state senator, he uh, was a very articulate speaker, a very well-organized campaign, very well-financed. He came from quite a wealthy family in Muscatine. And uh, it was a very, very close election. Uh, it got down to the final uh, uh, day, and out of more than a million votes cast for senator, Hughes won over Stanley by 4,200 votes. And this was a man that won landslide victories uh, several in a row as governor. Uh, but there were a lot of things going against him, the Vietnam War, his position against the war. And uh, his position was not to withdraw from Vietnam, but his position was to stop the bombing over North Vietnam in order to help initiate the peace talks that were going on then in Paris. Uh, Stanley opposed that. So, and then there was also Hughes' support for McCarthy. Again, not popular among some people in Iowa. But Hughes won and went to Washington, D.C. as senator. And as senator, he pushed for federal aid to alcoholics. And this was part of the bargain that he had with Kennedy. He said, okay, I will run for the Senate, uh, one, if you help me out financially, and Kennedy did, and two, uh, if you help me uh, get a good committee assignment so I'm able to push through federal aid for alcoholics. And with Kennedy's death, his brother carried on that promise, Edward Kennedy, who served on 
uh, the uh, uh, Social Welfare Committee, and, and Hughes got this legislation through. It was called the Comprehensive Alcohol Prevention, Treatment, and Rehabilitation Act of 1970, or otherwise known as the Hughes Act. And it turned alcoholism from a concept of moral failure and more into bringing up the concept of it as a preventable disease. And that's a legacy that lives to this day. There was the McGovern Fraser Commission created in the 1968 Democratic Convention. Uh, Hubert Humphrey got the nomination by taking part in no primaries. He got all his convention delegates, in effect, behind the scene, which is how things were done then. Um, prior to the convention, a group of individuals from Connecticut who were shut out of the Connecticut Convention for McCarthy, shut out by the political pros, came to Hughes and said, we need someone to lead a committee at the Democratic Convention in order to reform the delegate selection process. Hughes agreed to that. This became the Hughes Commission. And at the convention, in a, in a vote that was very little, not well publicized, uh, the Democratic Party agreed to look into reforms that would take effect with the 1972 convention. Uh, George McGovern, senator from South Dakota, was its first chairman. Hughes was the vice chairman. And in a matter of a couple of years, with, with them as, as the leaders, and McGovern withdrew in 1972 when he ran for the presidency and was replaced by Don Frazier, congressman from Minnesota. And Frazier was chairman and Hughes was vice chairman. The, the delegate selection process for the Democratic Party was dramatically transformed. It was more open, more open to minorities, to women, to young people. Uh, people like, in 1972, people like Mayor Daley were shut out of the convention. And there was significant and profound openness that was, that was brought into the Democratic Party process where probably individuals like George McGovern in 1972 would not have been nominated without them. Certainly Jimmy Carter in 1976 probably would not have been elected the Democratic nominee and uh, consequently being elected president. Uh, that would not have happened without these reforms. Hughes played a significant role in seeing that these changes were made. The Vietnam War continued, and Harold Hughes became a significant and profound opponent against the Vietnam War, urging that American troops be withdrawn. The Nixon administration policy was the, the policy of Vietnamization. That is, replacing American troops in Vietnam with South Vietnamese troops. Along the way, in, 19, in May of 1970, Nixon ordered the US invasion of Cambodia in order to take out North Vietnamese and communist uh, uh, sanctuaries there. Uh, among other things, this resulted in, in Kent State in, the, uh, in a protest. Several students were killed when National Guard troops fired on them. But the war continued, and Hughes was, was again a significant leader in trying to get our troops out of Vietnam. As he was in Washington, and here was Hughes, this significant uh, speaker, leader, charismatic politician, people began to pay close attention to him. And it wasn't long after he got to Washington that people started talking about him as a presidential candidate in 1972. Uh, some of his aides took that very seriously, set up an office in Washington, D.C., an exploratory office, set up an office in Des Moines, Iowa with a staff. Uh, Bill Knapp, uh, founder of Iowa Realty, uh, ran the, or funded the office and funded a lot of what was going on in D.C. as well. And uh, Hughes started taking it seriously as well. Uh, there was a meeting that he and his staff had in 1971 in his office where Hughes uh, uh, talked about some of the pressures on him and whether or not he would really go through with, with uh, this, this candidacy. And Hughes was rather blunt about some of the liabilities that he had. Uh, and talked about some of his religious beliefs. Uh, and someone overheard this conversation, and rumors started uh, uh, going around Washington, D.C. The Des Moines Register heard some of these rumors, particularly James Rizzer, the head of the Washington office, 
and George Anthem, another reporter. They approached Hughes' office and said, um, we've heard some of these rumors. We'd like to interview the senator. And, you know, we're a supportive newspaper, but some of this stuff's going to come out anyway. Better that we do it than, say, the National Enquirer. So Hughes agreed to an interview in the middle of 1971. And what came out of that uh, story was that Harold Hughes had taken part in seances. He believed he had talked to his dead brother. He believed he had uh, talked to um, other, other people who had passed away, and they told him information that he checked out later on that proved to be true. Uh, he expressed uh, some unconventional beliefs. He believed in ESP. Uh, he believed in spiritualism, uh, modern miracles, and uh, what that, when uh, that story appeared on the front page of the Sunday Register, um, and it was interesting, I talked with James Rizzer about this story, and he says, you'll notice a lot of the stuff that was controversial, you'll find we buried it, you know, in the article, but nevertheless, within two or three days afterwards, Hughes announced that he was not running for president. And this was one of the significant reasons. The other reason was that he found that he was having trouble reconciling himself as a presidential candidate and a senator. And he was finding that if he really ran for president, he'd have to sacrifice, he felt, he'd have to sacrifice some of his positions and in order to get the Democratic nomination. And he really didn't want to do that. So then he turned to uh, another major responsibility he had as senator, which was serving on the Senate Armed Services Committee with some of these gentlemen. Conservatives all. John Stennis of Mississippi, Barry Goldwater of Arizona, Strom Thurmond of uh, South Carolina, John Tower of Texas. In fact, Hughes got on the committee halfway through his Senate term because liberals had no representation on the committee, and, and, and Hughes was a liberal, a critic of American military spending. Uh, and what they wanted was someone on the committee before this legislation emerged out of the committee onto the Senate floor. Uh, and he was a diligent worker there. And one of the things that he uncovered was the secret bombing over North Vietnam. And a little bit of background here. In 1968, LBJ had a policy of stopping the bombing over North Vietnam in order to help facilitate the talks, the peace talks in Paris. Um, and what was created was something called rules of engagement, which was that the United States could send reconnaissance flights over North Vietnam, and they would be accompanied by bombers if the reconnaissance flights were fired upon or if they detected firing being locked into them, then they were free to bomb, but not until then. By 1960, 1972, however, they, the bombers were the lead reason for sending the planes into North Vietnam. Bombing sites were selected, and the reconnaissance flights were used as an excuse in order to send the missions over North Vietnam. This was initiated uh, by the Nixon administration because they were lowering the troop levels of Americans in South Vietnam, and they wanted to pressure the North Vietnamese to make concessions at the, at the uh, Paris peace talks and in discussions with Secretary of, uh, or uh, uh, National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger and his secret negotiations and put pressure on the North Vietnamese. Um, Lonnie Franks was a Cedar Rapids native, a 23-year-old um, military intelligence specialist based in Udorn Air Force Base in, in Thailand. And he was taking information from these bombers and reconnaissance flights when they came back over North Vietnam. In early January, uh, he, was, he was taking this information from the, the, the uh, pilots as they were coming in, and they said, we've released bombs. And he said, Did you, were you fired upon? And they said, the answer is no, but report that we were. Lonnie Franks was ordered to lie about these bombing missions. And, he was, and, and when the bombs were, were used, he was ordered to say that they had been fired upon. And he went up the, the ladder 
to his military superiors, and they said, follow your orders, son. And eventually he got to the point where it, it took a lot of time for here to get, for, as he said, get the wrong things right. And he was putting into permanent record in American military intelligence lies. So he wrote a letter to Harold Hughes. And I have a quote here. I'm writing this letter to inform you of what is happening to find out if this falsification of classified documents is legal and proper. Um, what happened was the Nixon administration um, or, or individuals in the Nixon administration had put pressure on General John Lavelle in order to, to increase bombing targets in order to put pressure on the North Vietnamese. Um, and after this letter was given to Hughes, and by the way, I found this in the Hughes collection at the university. And the day I found it, I think I yelped or something like that. I think they had to calm me down. Um, and uh, Hughes took it to the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, and they took it to the Pentagon. The Pentagon sent an investigator to North Vietnam, or sent an investigator to Vietnam. John Lavelle was relieved of duty. And... Uh, the excuse was is that he retired. Uh, that didn't go over well in, in the Senate Armed Services Committee. Eventually, they investigated. And what Hughes uh, tried to get uh, the background information and to find out what actually happened on this. And to the end of his term, he could not actually find out who gave the order to John Lavelle, to some of the to Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird, or whatever. Uh, there was a lot of... of uh, hesitation, ostification in the, uh, in the Pentagon. What came out years later in the Nixon tapes is that Richard Nixon himself ordered the military to lie. And they ordered him to fudge those records so that he could put pressure again on the North Vietnamese. Uh, Hughes suspected this, but couldn't really prove it during his time. As his Senate term ended, uh, it was no secret among friends of Harold Hughes that he was uh, unhappy with life in the Senate. Uh, he'd been used to being governor of Iowa, uh, an executive, and if you're the senator, you're one among 100 individuals. And so in 1974, uh, he declared that he was not going to run for re-election. And this upset an awful lot of Democrats in Iowa, and again, another one of the Frank Miller cartoons, where Hughes announced that he was uh, not going to, to run and announced he was going into religious work. And as this, uh, this uh, elephant with a grin from trunk to trunk, maybe he'll be giving you nice sermons that'll inspire you. Uh, and that Democratic donkey looks like he needs a lot of inspiration. Uh, he went into ministry work, into lay ministry work, and into counseling alcoholics. In 1981, he came back to Iowa and worked for Iowa Realty as a counselor. Uh, essentially, he came back because he'd been living by going around the country making speeches, and he was tired of that. And he was broke, is what he basically told people. And when he came back to Iowa, there was a conversation and speculation that he would be running for governor in 1982. Uh, and that conversation got real serious. Um, 1982 marked the end of the administration of Bob Ray, who had been governor for 14 years. With Hughes running, there was speculation on the Republican side that Ray simply couldn't walk away, that there would be this, and, uh, this, this clash between two great political titans in Iowa history for the governorship in 1982. Uh, Hughes set up a committee uh, to look into his running for governor, and uh, really got serious about talking about it. Then uh, one of the aides on the committee looked up and said, well, wait a minute. I found this requirement in the Iowa Constitution that you've got to be a resident of the state for two years. And Hughes, in 1980, had been living in Maryland and voted in the Maryland election. And in doing so, he signed a document that he was a citizen of Maryland. And when that came out, uh, there, was, there were ways that he could have gotten around that uh, illegally, but that would have required dragging the legal issue on into 1982 
with no sure uh, uh, resolution that you might know how it's going to come out. So uh, Hughes took himself out of the campaign. Ray did not run. His lieutenant governor, Terry Branstead, did and was elected governor for the next 140 years. Hughes, in, in uh, the mid-1980s, uh, had difficulties with, all along with his wife, Ava. He divorced her and married a, a woman he'd known for quite some time, Julie Holm, uh, and lived in the Des Moines area, also lived in Arizona. Uh, he went there because he had lung problems. He was a lifelong smoker. Julie Holm convinced him not to, uh, to give up smoking. And uh, Harold Hughes died in Arizona in 1996. And let me just read a little bit that I wrote about his life. Hughes was a man of unusual candor and directness, but it was how he expressed himself that so impressed people. He was a large, six foot three, 230 pound man, handsome, gifted with a deep, booming voice, and his speeches could bring crowds to tears as he expressed empathy and compassion for the less fortunate. He spoke eloquently about the suffering of others, applying in one writer's words, quote, the compassion of one who has known and overcome despair, end quote. Residing within this individual was an uneasy soul of immense contradictions. Hughes was a recovered alcoholic who sought to expand legal liquor sales in Iowa, a college dropout who could easily discourse with intellectuals, a sincere Christian who swore like a vulgar stable hand, and an ambitious politician who walked away from political power to follow his own inner calling. Compounding these contradictions was a man willing to learn and change as his political career advanced, reflecting not opportunism, but a capacity for growth. Changing his position on Vietnam is one example. His outlook on black Iowans is another, gained by meeting with them week after week in their neighborhoods to understand their lives. And at an intensely personal level, Hughes continually re-examined his religious outlook, altering his theological beliefs throughout his life. This trait alone, his ability to reflect internally and modify strong held, strongly held beliefs, makes Hughes a political actor worth studying. This is the individual born on that day of flames in western Iowa in 1922. But fire may not be the best image to mark this man. Perhaps a better one is thunder, a deep, rumbling sound heralding the passion of an Old Testament God. This metaphor, thunder from the prairie, illustrates Harold Hughes, a man of weight and depth who dramatically impacted countless lives, moved others to take productive action, and made a positive difference in the way we live today. And that's Harold Hughes. <laughs> Thank you. And are there any questions? Does anybody have anything they'd like to ask? Yeah. <laughs> Let me come over to you. So can you expand a little bit on how he was able to get so many Republicans to vote for him? I mean, that just seems, in today's age, that just is something we don't think happens, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and he was. There were a lot of Republicans that voted for him in, 19, in 1962, 60, especially 64 and 66. I think because he had a business understanding. I mean, he was a business operator in the trucking industry. And there were a lot of positions taken by liberal Democrats that he did not go along with. Um, I didn't talk about uh, uh, one issue, which was the, uh, the labor issue of, of the closed shop. And that was a big issue in 1965 in the legislature, where um, there were Democrats who wanted to um, uh, mandate that you join a union before you, you, you uh, get a job. And he opposed that. He had some sort of compromise in mind. Uh, but I, I think 
that was one way he was able to attract Republican votes. It was his business stand and, and his understanding of the business community, which, of course, is a significant constituency in the Republican Party. Another was just, I mean, he was attractive to people. And no matter what your party alignment, he took strong positions. And, and I think there are a lot of Iowans that say, you know, we may not agree with you, but we respect your, your, your ability to, to stand up for what you believe. And I think he had a sincerity about him, certainly a charisma about him, that attracted a lot of people that perhaps other Democrats wouldn't have attracted. And he was able to, to work across party lines. Um, I think the, the work he did in 1967 to work with the Republican Senate, and they were fierce partisans, but I think they were Iowans first. And, and the, all the accomplishments that the legislature did in 1967 was, was bipartisan. And, uh, and, then, and then there was also his, his actions in the United States Senate. Um, he worked with some arch conservatives, uh, one in the Senate Armed Services Committee, and also he uh, was a member of the, uh, the Senate prayer breakfast, which met every Wednesday. And... Uh, as he, as he said, his staff referred to that group as the, as the Neanderthals. But there were some pretty conservative people there, Republicans or conservative Democrats, uh, that he was able to break bread with in the morning and converse. So he, he was a man that, that could, among those reasons, reach across party lines. Do you, do you remember him? Oh, yeah. 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 I would have been uh, eight in 1968, so I remember, you know, when Bob Ray first came in after him. But yeah, yeah. Um, if, the, if, if Hughes and Ray had run against one another in 1982, uh, James Flansburg of the Des Moines Register said it would be mighty interesting to see, to see that campaign, and it would be interesting to see what they disagreed about. Because they were of like minds when they were, uh, uh, when they were governor. I think it could be argued that Ray carried on a lot of the reforms that Hughes started. In, in terms of making um, Iowa government more efficient and, and a better, better government. Could you talk a little bit about um, the research that you had to do for this? Because I, I know you mentioned his earlier yeah. autobiogra autobiography, but um, also finding, going through his papers at the university. And yeah. Um, I did things a little bit backward because I had to. Uh, what my strategy was, was to begin with the newspapers. And um, Iowa has two good newspapers, or three that I used, that I went through every issue of the Des Moines Register and the Cedar Rapids Gazette from 1962 until 1974. You know, that's on the microfilm with the machines. You know? <laughs> and I also went through every issue of the Des Moines Tribune, which is a local Des Moines afternoon newspaper, from 1962 to 68, and that basically covered his time as governor. It was a local afternoon newspaper. Um, so when you do a biography, you've got an innate beginning and an end, birth and death. So, but his, and his governorship began in 62, and I, and I took it to 74 at the end of his Senate. So that was, the time was confined. Then there were his papers which are, are housed in the third floor in special collections at the university library, and uh, a wealth of information. What's neat about that is you can go behind the headlines and find out a lot of the uh, information in private correspondence that I, I made use of here and uh, discover you know, some of the internal documents that were there. And the other thing that I, that I had to do, and, and I would say that if everything was uh, perfect, then once you have all that, then you go do the interviews. And I interviewed about 26 people who knew Hughes, 26, 28. Um, but I had to do those, a lot of them up front, because some of these people are not young. <laughs> and in fact, there were like, I, as I recall, there were three people that I interviewed that have since have, have passed on. Uh, but that was the fun part. That was the real fun part. The, a major source that I had was uh, Dwight Jensen of Iowa City, who was his executive assistant as governor. And uh, he was, I, I, I probably spent like eight or ten hours with him. 
uh, talk. And then he has, has another significant aide in Des Moines, Ed, uh, uh, Bill Hedlund. Uh, he has a Hughes has a surviving daughter, uh, Phyllis Hughes Ewing, who lives in Des Moines, who was a delight. And uh, uh, Dick Clark, senator from Iowa, who served as senator with Hughes for uh, his last two years. Talked with Tom Harkin, former senator, um, and a number of others. I talked with a couple Pulitzer Prize winning reporters, James Rizzer of the Des Moines Register, uh, Nick Cotts, who worked for the Register and the... Uh, uh, the Washington Post. So that was, and I also talked with Lonnie Franks, who uh, in 1972 was a 23 year old kid, I call him, and that was the most fascinating interview of all of this young man who took this chance to stand up for, for truth. You know, he didn't like that he was lying, um, he didn't feel that the system served him well, but uh, I, I just I admired the courage of this young man. So uh, that was the fun part. So that, and then when you get all that stuff together, then you start to write a book. And that's when COVID hit. <laughs> so it was kind of appropriate. You know, and I didn't get out much. And, uh, you know, that's when I put the book together. It took me about, um, I think, about six years, six, seven years or so. If not, thank you. Thank well, you very thank much. Thank you so much. And you've yep. got copies of the book here. And for those at home, uh, you can order through any of your local uh, bookstores or wherever you like to find it. But it's also University of Kansas Press. Uh, University Press of Kansas. University Press of Kansas. Yeah. Um, where you can find it and order it there. Thanks again. Thank you.